Um, yeah, I really love some of the stuff that he says. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't have diabetes because you have a pill deficiency, right? You don't have high blood pressure because of a pill deficiency. Women don't get infertile from polycystic ovarian syndrome because of a pill deficiency. And, and another thing that, that he said, which is something that I use in my presentations, and he said, uh, God made you for health. And I, I say you were born perfect. You know, your, your body is perfect. You just have to feed your body fuel that it understands. So let's talk about fuel that your body understands and doesn't understand. Pop quiz. Which one of these foods raises your blood sugar the highest? Bread. Bread. Yeah. This is the, the best educated uh, audience. There's something called glycemic index, and glycemic index measures how fast a food raises your blood sugar. The one with the lowest glycemic index is the banana. Banana is a very high carbohydrate fruit. It's a very high carb fruit. Which one is next worst for raising your blood sugar, Snickers or table sugar? Snickers. Glycemic index 55. A tablespoon of pure table sugar has a glycemic index of 68. Does anybody know what the glycemic index is of this heart healthy whole grain, whole wheat bread? Yeah, 71. So what I'm telling you is that this shows a major disconnect that we have in our thinking about food because we know in our mind, like we know like fruit is supposed to be healthy. We've got that. We know Snickers and table sugar, not really healthy. But what we are sold and what we are told is that whole grain, whole wheat bread is healthy for us to eat. It may be as healthy or healthier than uh, fruit. Our doctor tells us eat more heart healthy whole grains. But the whole grains are going to raise your blood sugar, raise the insulin, and call it, cause that whole insulin cascade of disease we showed earlier. Uh, the whole wheat's going to cause that to happen worse than these other foods. And I'm not saying that this is a good choice. Right? <laughs> you know? but, but, but I'm saying in our, in our mind, we think this is. We were told that this is. And that's why you cut the bottom off the food pyramid and just cut the killer carbs. And this is a quote from Wheat Belly, the book. It says, two slices of whole wheat bread raise blood sugar higher than six teaspoons of table sugar. Judged from the perspective of glycemic index, whole wheat is among the worst of all foods. Worse than sucrose, which is table sugar. Worse than ice cream. Worse than a Snickers bar. That's why you eliminate the grains from your diet. Your body doesn't know what to do with them. This is a, what many people would consider to be a typical American meal. That's a tuna sandwich on whole wheat bread, fat-free yogurt, um, apple, and then a bounty bar. And after, this is from dietdoctor.com, after he ate this meal, his blood sugar, which started out around 90, doubled to 180. And this slide shows after that meal, that exact meal. And so this slide shows what happens. What happens is, when the blood sugar goes up that high to like 180, the, the sugar gets into the cells of your body, it cross-links the protein. You get these advanced glycation end products. It damages the cells in your body, the sugar being high, number one. Number two, the insulin has to increase. Insulin goes up to combat that high blood sugar and bring it back down. And when the insulin goes up, that causes the whole insulin cascade of disease that we showed in the first hour, all of those diseases. And number three, what happens is a couple, two, three hours later, the blood sugar dips below normal. And when it dips below normal, you're hungry. That's why um, people have to get in the habit of eating a mid-morning snack, a mid-afternoon snack, a midnight snack. It's because they have to combat this hypo glycemia, this low blood sugar. This is the second meal, enormous steak, vegetables, and Bernays sauce. Bernays sauce is fat, 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 and fat. 
<laughs> the guy's blood sugar, even. Even kill the whole time. He doesn't have the glucose spike damaging his cell. He doesn't have the insulin spike causing the insulin cascade of disease. And he doesn't have the dip making him hungry a few hours later. That's why a lot of people, when they go on low-carb, high-fat diet, they eat less. And they eat less because they're not feeding the hypoglycemia. And if you find yourself starving, a little shaky, hungry, um, you get that feeling like, oh man, I've got to eat something. I feel horrible. I, just think, what is the last thing that you ate? And for me, I had some episodes like that when I was first beginning my diet. And I had this hypoglycemic, shaking, starving feeling. And I would think back and what I had eaten that morning for breakfast was oatmeal. Some sort of high carb food. Anyway, I dumped the oatmeal. Now, carbohydrates are... Um, these killer carbs are habit-forming substances because, number one, you get in the habit of eating every couple of hours to feed your hypoglycemia. Number two, sugar gets you in the habit, that same habit, but it also stimulates the reward center of the brain, and that's what makes sugar mildly addictive. Wheat does the same thing, but wheat contains within it exorphins, and the exorphins actually stimulate the reward center of your brain, making wheat a uniquely addicting food. So what I'm telling you is, even if you don't shoot up in the back alley, even if you don't do heroin or you don't smoke pot, you're still doing an addictive, <laughs> health-destroying drug. And that drug is wheat. So what I'm telling you to do today is just say no to drugs. <laughs> <coughs> and I'll talk some more about the uniquely bad aspects of wheat. Wheat is known as the great acidifier. Uh, wheat in your diet acidifies your pH, your body pH, and so your body has to buffer that acid. It buffers it by stealing the calcium salts from your bones. You end up with osteoporosis. Um, Wheat is pro-inflammatory. We'll talk about that in the next slide. It's allergenic. Um, it's addictive. We talked about in the last slide. It breaks down the intestinal barrier, which causes all sorts of allergy and uh, inflammatory problems. It raises blood sugar more than table sugar. We talked about that. And lots of people have immune reactions to wheat without even realizing it. And the only way to know if you have one is to cut the wheat out of your diet and see what happens. You may be surprised. The, it's the gluten in wheat and other grains, the gluten that breaks down these tight junctions in your intestinal barrier. You're supposed to have these tight junctions, but they're supposed to be tight. They keep the bacteria that's in your digestive system out of your bloodstream. But the gluten breaks down those tight junctions, and the bacteria, the fungus, your food can all come through the intestinal barrier to stimulate your immune system. And it can stimulate your immune system to attack the digestive tract. And when it di attacks the digestive tract, that's when you get irritable bowel syndrome, constipation. It can worsen, worsen ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, uh, diverticulitis, diverticulosis, appendicitis, the whole list of bowel problems. But also, this immune reaction can cause antibodies, and those antibodies can go through your bloodstream to cause uh, chronic inflammation in other parts of your body, whether it's your nervous system, inflammatory diseases like arthritis, or um, allergies, can stimulate your immune system to cause allergies. Because I mean, how else do you explain when my son eats wheat, he sneezes for three days. He doesn't stick the wheat in his nose. You know what I mean? It goes through his entire immune system and then it manifests as a nasal allergy. So the reason the killer carbs are killer carbs is this. This is a blood sugar level over time in a diabetic. Pure glucose raises blood sugar the highest. Potatoes are on the killer carb list because they raise the blood sugar the second highest. Oatmeal and bread, a close tie. Rice, it's also high, raises blood sugar. And someone asked the question about beans, where do beans fit in? Beans are not a killer carb. These are lentils and kidney beans. They're not a killer carb because they don't cause that huge spike in the blood sugar. 
They, uh, they have carbohydrate in them, but most of the carbohydrate is a different type of amylopectin that's not really well digested, so the blood sugar doesn't go as high. We talked about insulin leading to the insulin cascade of disease. The one food in these patients that raises the insulin level higher than anything else is the opium. So that, you know, insulin is going to stimulate fat growth. It's going to cause the blood pressure. It's going to burn out your pancreas. I have an aunt who, eats, who has type 2 diabetes and eats oatmeal every single day for breakfast because her doctor told her it was good for her heart. <laughs> it may be good for her heart, but it's burning out her pancreas. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of insulin resistance, and she's pumping out tons of insulin, burning out her pancreas. Other killer carbs, bread, potato, and here's pure glucose, rice. And then down here, this is the insulin response to lentils and kidney beans. Again, the insulin response to beans is relatively low, so you can eat beans. And the really good news is this. This is a patient with diabetes. Here's their insulin curve. The top curve is their insulin curve. Um, when they're diabetic, and after one year on a low-carb, high-fat diet, their insulin curve normalizes, just like a normal human being without diabetes. So a low-carb, high-fat diet can cure insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. How do we know that insulin grows fat? This is a difficult slide to really see, maybe because of the light. These are two giant tumors on a woman's thighs. And she, uh, this is where she injected herself with insulin every day for her type 1 diabetes. And it's known that insulin injections cause tumors of fat. They cause fat growth. And that's why they tell a type 1 diabetic, inject yourself in a different place every day so that um, you don't end up with a big fatty tumor. And we talked about this whole insulin cascade of disease. If you eat the foods like oatmeal that skyrocket your insulin, it increases your risk for all of these things. But the great thing is that the human body is a hybrid power machine. Your body is perfectly happy to run off fat or run off carbohydrates. This is a mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, and the mitochondria produces ATP, which is energy. It's the energy medium for your entire body. And you can feed that uh, carbohydrate into the mitochondria. This is the same thing in mitochondria. You can feed it with carbohydrates or feed it with fat. Either way, you're going to produce plenty of energy. But if you feed it with the carbohydrates, then you get all those adverse effects that we've been talking about. This is a typical food pyramid, feeds carbohydrates in, and this is cut the killer carbs food pyramid. And a lot of people ask me, you know, who, who should benefit, who should be on a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet? And the truth is, most Americans should, because about a third of us are overweight and a third are obese. So that's two thirds of Americans that are overweight or obese. And out of these, this third that's normal weight, there's a bunch of people in here with high blood pressure, inflammatory disease, bowel disease, and other things. And most of these people could benefit even from a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And another way to look at the same information is this. We all know that person who can eat, this, this is, grams of carbohydrates per day. This is weight for body mass index. But we all know that guy who can eat as much of whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and his weight never changes one bit. Perfectly healthy. And so there are some people who are extremely carbohydrate tolerant. They can eat whatever they want, and this conference really isn't for them. The majority of Americans, though, fall into this middle where the more carbohydrates we eat per day, the bigger we get, the more insulin resistant we get. And there are some people who are extremely carbohydrate intolerant, and they get very obese at even low levels of carbohydrate. But the good news is this, if you pull this graph back to somewhere around 60 to 100 net carbs a day, everybody's weight kind of normalizes. And so if you pull, where you sit on this graph just depends on how much carbs you eat and your insulin resistance. And you just lower the carbs to this kind of 50 to 100 net carbs per day. If you want to really lose weight, you lower the carbs down to here, 20 or less. And so, yes ma'am? That's in a day. Per day. Uh-huh, per day. Uh, this is an Inuit family. The Inuit are the Native Americans in Alaska, Canada. And uh, this is from 100 years ago. And there they are, slim, happy, healthy, active people. 
And you take these people and you put them on a modern American diet of processed uh, carbohydrates and refined grains, and they end up looking like this. These are pictures from my big fat diet in Canada. Dr. Jay Wartman, he's part Indian, and so that's why he has an interest in the Native American population in Canada. And in my big fat diet in Canada, they, they take these people and they put them on a low carb, high fat diet. And the good news is that when you cut the killer carbs, they can go back to looking like this. They can have their health restored. And the same thing goes for, um, this, is, this is a crow warrior. And if you think about a Plains Indian in your mind, the Plains Indians were uh, healthy, active, strong people. And you want to know what the modern crow look like today? These are modern crows. Same tribe. You take these people, you put them on a modern American diet, they get all the diseases of civilization. But the good news is this, you can cut the killer carbs and you can reverse that. <coughs> So what I'm telling you is that if you power your body with refined carbohydrates, grains, and sugar, then you're at increased risk for all of these diseases that we had mentioned before. Or you can choose to cut the killer carbs, remove the bottom off the food pyramid, and power your body with uh, fat, butter, and by doing that you're at reduced risk for all of the same diseases. Your mitochondria is perfectly happy to provide you energy either way. But some people object and they say, we know the brain needs glucose. And basically, I'll tell you it doesn't. Your brain doesn't need sugar because your brain is perfectly happy to run on beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body. Um, and also, by burning fat, some, some of the fat can be converted into some glucose and some protein can be converted into some glucose. And it, it can go to your brain and feed your brain. In fact, there's a book called Alzheimer's Disease, What If There Was a Cure? And uh, some people call Alzheimer's disease type three diabetes because the brain cannot use glucose, cannot use sugar. So they treat people with coconut oil because the coconut oil makes beta, hydrox beta hydroxybutyrate to, to metabolize in the brain and it improves their symptoms. So we'll do this section called LCHF Basic Training, and the focus here is on real food. The f you want to pick foods that basically don't require a package and don't require a label. You can shop the meat counter, the fish counter, the cheese counter, full fat dairy, all the full fat dairy you want, um, fruits, avocados, heavy cream, whipping cream. Those are the type of real foods that you should eat on a low carb, high fat diet. This is a section that my wife's going to give, and the baby is taking a nap. So we're going to skip it. <laughs> and then when the baby gets done with the nap, we'll come back to it. <laughs> this is included in your handout. This is from drchase.com. These are foods to eat, foods to eat sometimes, and foods to stop. Foods that you can eat anytime as much as you want, meats of any type, eggs, vegetables grown above the ground. Full fat dairy, cream, heavy cream, high fat cheeses, nuts and seed. I snack on nuts all the time. Nuts, nuts are my number one go-to snack food. I also eat uh, full fat yogurt uh, quite often. It's good for breakfast, it's good for snacks, it's good for lunch. Um, root vegetables, you can eat some at a time. Those are like the sweet potatoes, yams. Fruit, you should eat some in a small amount. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Alcohol, uh, you can choose low carb alcohol. My overall feeling about alcohol is that alcohol is a toxin. And if you have any question whether or not you drank toxin in the bar last night, how do you feel the next day? <laughs> it's, it's like obvious, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'll tell you a book to read about alcohol if you're interested. And dark chocolate, we eat dark chocolate quite often. And these foods to avoid are, number one, the killer carbs, sugar and anything containing sugar, starch and grain, and then processed oils, margarine and cooking oils. These are the polyunsaturated oils and hydrogenated oils that are bad for your heart. And beer, which is full of carbs, is essentially liquid bread. So. Can you lose weight and still drink? Yes. I drank, when I started losing weight, I still drank, and then 
during the health journey, I decided I would stop. I was kind of on a health journey, so I decided, well, I'll stop drinking Diet Cokes because I couldn't think of anything good in a Diet Coke for me. And then I stopped drinking alcohol because I figured alcohol was a toxin. Yes, sir. Uh, any benefits to drinking skim milk over whole milk? <clears throat> there are many benefits to the drug industry <laughs> in skim milk. The truth is that the, the fatter your dairy is, the healthier it is. Because if you think about skim milk, what they've done with skim milk, skim milk contains a carbohydrate called lactose, and it also contains some protein, and it contains fat. So if they skim off all of the fat, then all you're left with is carbs and some protein. So skim milk is more like drinking fruit juice or a soda because it's more carbohydrate. Uh, if you're going to drink milk, drink full fat milk, that would be good. The best thing for you, if you're going to use milk for something like a smoothie, use whipping cream or heavy cream. It's really high in fat because you're going to have a lot more fat and a lot less carbohydrate. Real foods that don't require a label. And here's a question, like how much fat should I eat? I get this one. The average American diet gets 65% of its calories from fat. And you need to flip that over on its head. You get 65% of your calories from healthy, saturated fat. And that's why heavy cream or whipping cream would be better for you than skim milk. Because you're going to get your calories from saturated fat. You only need about 30% of your uh, calories from protein and 5% from your carbs. And this comes from Stephen Finney, an MD, PhD, who's the author of The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Living. And it, you know, people sometimes ask, well, how can I get that much of my diet? How can I get that much fat? I put coconut oil, a tablespoon of coconut oil in my coffee. Do that in the morning and I'll have like a couple of cups of coffee like that. Um, you cook with a lot of butter. Um, if you're going to make a smoothie, or if you're going to have, for dessert, you can just whip whipped cream and put berries on it. So you, you, you need to work on getting more fat. The first year I did, the first two years I did my diet, I ate very low carb, but I didn't eat really exceptionally high fat. And my HDL stayed 40, 42 to 44. And the last year I increased my fat intake significantly. And it was increasing my fat intake, which made my HDL, good cholesterol, increase from 42, 44 to 76. Your brain, your brain is made mainly of fat and cholesterol. Your brain needs fat and cholesterol. So what I'll do here is I'm going to go back to the section that, or the slides my wife's going to do. That's her with the kiddos, and I'm going to go run and play with the little one outside for about two minutes. And she will do foods to eat any time. This is my wife, Lauren Henderson. She's the head chef and the head cook and the head shopper in our home. And so she'll kind of give you some practical implications and some uh, things about foods that we eat at our house. Thing, do I know what it is? Um, then I think you will accomplish a lot of 
whatever it is that you came here for. Because I'm assuming people are here for different reasons today. Maybe you've got high blood sugar, maybe you want to lose weight, maybe you just want to feel better, maybe you want to get off medication. So going back to a more, I mean, that's what I try to do for our family, is going back to a more whole foods. And with those, you're going to naturally be lower carbohydrates um, for the most part. So I'm going to just show you some foods that are foods to eat anytime. And if you have questions during this, like, please just stop me and I will try to answer those. Um, I'm going backwards, sorry. Meat. You can pick any meat. If you can afford it, look for meat that's grass-fed um, or free-range. Um, that may also be organic, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just grass-fed organic if it comes from a smaller producer. They may not pay to have the organic symbol on there. Fish. Sorry, I'm turning this wrong right there. Fish. If you can, uh, again, if you can afford it, buy fish that's wild-caught. And I'm going to tell you why for both of those in just a minute. Same thing with eggs. If you can find eggs that come from chickens that have been out on the grass, um, get those. Um, the reasons for looking for things that come from animal sources in or in their natural habitat, they're going to be higher, in, mainly higher in omega-3 and lower in cholesterol. If you can't afford that or you can't find it, then still buy meat, still buy fish, still buy eggs. Um, but in terms of the density of nutrients, you're going to get more nutrient-dense food from animals that are doing their animal things. <laughs> <laughs> that they're being happy animals. Vegetables. Pick any vegetable you like. And people tell me all the time, especially with kids, my kids hate vegetables. We hate vegetables. Um, so I would encourage you to talk to people who like vegetables, talk to people whose kids like vegetables, and see what are they doing to them, because you actually may be doing more than you need to be doing. Um, food that's in season, and especially food that's locally produced, you really shouldn't need to do very much to it. It shouldn't have to be cooked a lot. It shouldn't have to have you know a ton of seasoning added to it. It really should kind of be able to stand on its own. So vegetables are going to be, should be a really good friend. Um, I have berries on here instead of fruit. Reason being, fruit varies greatly in its sugar content. So depending on what your reasons are for being here today, you may want to avoid some fruits like bananas, pineapples, mangoes, things that are super, super high in, in carbohydrates. So when you go to the store, if you can just think berries, if you really are here because you're trying to lower your blood sugar, then berries are going to be your lowest carbohydrate <coughs> fruits. Um, and that's obviously strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, boysenberries, um, fresh or frozen. Nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds are awesome. They're fiber, nutrients, vitamins, minerals. They also need no refrigeration. So they're like a great thing to like keep stashed in the glove off of your car, keep in your bag. Um, it'll be the thing that like saves you from the Twinkie in the snack machine. You know, like you're hungry, you forgot a snack. Um, if you can, if you have kids, if you can get them in the habit of eating nuts and seeds, then it's, they're, they're just so high in protein also. Um, almonds. Anyway, I, I can't really say enough about nuts and seeds. Yes? Uh, just, just to clarify, do you uh, include peanuts in that? I do include peanuts in that. I mean, technically a peanut is a legume, but um, I mean, I think peanuts, we eat peanuts at our house. Um, if you want to get it, I mean, you can get into these hierarchies of food, so if you want to like Almonds are probably almonds and walnuts are going to be your like best choice. But if you're if cost is a concern at all, then like mixing in some peanuts, mixing in some pecans, like some things that are a bit less expensive, um, in with almonds and walnuts. I mean, we eat them. So. <laughs> yes. Okay, so is there a certain kind of nut that's better, uh, or can you get pistachios and sunflower seeds? Now, I know some of them have some sodium, but... I mean, we usually mix salted and unsalted. So we'll usually, like, for instance, get like unsalted almonds, um, unsalted pecans, I'm trying to think what else, unsalted walnuts, 
And then we will usually mix in like a dry roasted salted peanut just because it tastes good, you know. Um, but you're right, if you go with like all salted nuts or if you go with honey roasted nuts, then, I mean, but again, if you're at the snack machine and you're picking between a Twinkie <laughs> and honey roasted peanuts, like go for the honey roasted peanuts because it's still a peanut. Um, but yeah, sodium could be a concern, especially depending on what your issues are. Um, okay, this may go against, well, may, may be like, oh, but full fat dairy. And again, we're kind of back to when our bodies were made, what was there? Well, it was like milk from a cow, you know, like your grandma or great grandma or whatever did not extract out milk fat before they drank the milk. Um, so if you can, if you can buy, you know, full fat yogurts, full fat cheeses, full fat dairy, what it's going to do is it's going to help your body better absorb everything that you're eating from all of these nutrient-dense foods. Um, and then on to the next point are full-fat oils. Full-fat oils are coconut oil, um, avocados, olive oil, lard. Lard is not the same thing as Crisco. Lard comes from animals. It's rendered animal fat. Um, you can render it yourself. Um, if you want to send me an email, there are some girls that render tallow in town and will sell it to you. Um, so for frying, if you fry things, then do it in full fat oils. Um, coconut oil has also shown a lot of reversing like effects of degenerative things like Alzheimer's, like people who they have had on like a regimen of coconut oil have actually like gained back memory and gained back function. So I don't know what the magical thing is of coconut oil, but I think it's actually kind of magical. <laughs> really, I do. Um, drinks. This is probably a part where the most, I think most people may have been sold the idea that like diet drinks, and I don't know if Justin has talked about that yet, but that like diet drinks are good for you. Um, again, going back to kind of philosophy of what was around when our bodies were made, there were tea, it comes from leaves, there was coffee, it comes from a bean, and there was water. Um, the artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, artificial flavors, they just confuse your body. So if you can get in the habit of drinking water, tea, coffee, um, again, it's just going to I believe, help your body process everything that you're eating and then let your body spend the energy that it's normally using trying to figure out what red number 40 is to help keep your body feeling good. Um, these are sometimes foods. Depending on what your goals are for being here today, then these are things that I think eating in small quantities, um, they're going to raise your blood sugar, but... Um, if you have gotten down to a weight that you're happy with and you're not needing to take medication for the blood sugar, then these are things that um, do have a lot of vitamins and minerals. Um, rice, if you do that, I would try to do a whole grain rice simply because it takes your body longer to process it. So the sugar from the rice is not entering your bloodstream as quickly. Um, same thing with beans, same thing with potatoes. Um, Sweet potatoes are going to take a little bit longer for your body to process than a white potato. These are indulgences um, so that you feel like you're doing something really naughty. <laughs> um, chocolate. Chocolate actually does have a lot of good health properties to it, but what a lot of people do is if you're going to eat a milk chocolate, then you're not getting very much of the actual chocolate. You're getting a little bit of chocolate, a lot of sugar. So if you can get in a habit of choosing a dark chocolate, then you're getting all the antioxidants, all the vitamins and minerals from the cocoa bean itself and not a lot of the sugar. And if you cut the sugar out of other things, then you'll be amazed at how sweet like a dark chocolate tastes to you because your body is not used to all the sugar all the time. So it will actually become a super big treat. Um, if you drink alcohol, um, look for one that is dry and doesn't have sugar added. Those are going to be your red wines and then your liquors, but I think a lot of people mix in soda with liquor. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're trying to not do wheat, then obviously most beers are not going to be good for you because they're, you know, fermented. A lot of them are fermented wheat. Um, so... <laughs> 
okay, you may be thinking, oh my gosh, I have no idea how to implement this in my home because I do things other than stay in the kitchen all day. <laughs> um, so the first technique is the thing that is like the lifesaver at our house. When I cook something, I try to make three meals at once. So if I mix up burgers, instead of just doing a pound of burgers, I mix up three pounds of burgers. I cook all the burgers at once, we eat part of it, we freeze the rest. Um, same deal with eggs in the morning. Um, I do not want to be up cooking eggs every day, so I make up a big casserole of eggs, I cut them apart, we eat part of it that morning, I freeze the rest. And so I really try to do it either on a Saturday or Sunday to where I kind of prep stuff for the week, and that way I'm not like in the kitchen every single day. Um, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, how do you guys eat out? Well, it's really easy to eat out. Um, you can kind of go anywhere. You're just gonna kind of change usually the vehicle on which your food is delivered. So usually your burger comes out delivered on the yeah, yeah. You just want the burger to come out delivered on lettuce instead. So you can really, I mean, there are a wide variety of choices of things to eat out. Um, for instance, we yeah. love the muffaletta at Jason's yeah. Deli. You know, it usually comes on a bun that's about this big, and then, you know, there's meat on there. But they will actually run that through the toaster so you get the, like, delicious, cheesy goodness, um, and it just comes out on a plate instead. So they will look at you like you're crazy, <laughs> but they'll make it, and then it's really awesome. So you don't have to cook all the time if you want to eat this way. Um, if there are things that you can't live without, like, I love pancakes. They're like, I love pancakes. I really want a pancake on Saturday. So you can still eat a pancake on Saturday, but cook it yourself, and instead of using whole wheat flour, use almond flour. Um, there are a slew of recipes. I love Alana's Pantry. She has a great website, a great blog, and then some really good cookbooks out. Um, most of the recipes are actually less labor-intensive than cooking flour because there's not the kneading, there's not the rising. Um, also sometimes, like the kids and I wanted to make pumpkin bread the other day, so you can literally just type in all the flour pumpkin bread and up will come a bunch of different recipes. Um, my last thing, and I kind of can't stress this enough, is don't replace one, I'm going to say negative with another negative. Um, there's been a huge um, influx of gluten-free foods on the market. I really think it's because companies can make a ton of money for them. Um, because it's not that their raw ingredients are less expensive. It's potato starch, rice starch, tapioca starch. I think it's just that this the gluten-free has kind of become a trend, I think. Um, all of these things that... A potato on its own is not great for your blood sugar, but if they've taken a potato and they've broken it down even further to where you don't even have to chew it, then it just enters your bloodstream even faster. So when you go to the store, do not be disillusioned by the wide array. I mean, there's like a half an aisle like at the store of gluten-free choices, most of which all begin with potato starch. So, gluten free does not mean low carb. No, that's true. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like, yes, you're not going to be eating the wheat, but you're going to be kind of messing with your blood chemistry in a way that you weren't before. So, do we like have questions? I don't want to time. It's probably way worse than this. Yes, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, well, thank you guys. Actually, you're not in trouble. The whole thing's been running a little bit slow this afternoon. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, <laughs> I'm going to go through just a couple of slides here and then um, and skip a few, and then we'll take a break. But basically, talking about carbohydrates, what you want to if you stick to meat, veg meat and vegetables, uh, eggs, those sort of things, you don't have to count carbs. But for other foods, you may wonder, is this healthy or not? How many carbohydrates is this? Is this considered low carb? You have to count net carbs, and you do that by, this is in your handout, by the way. Taking total carbohydrate, subtracting the fiber, that gives you the net carbs. 
And for most people, if they eat less than 20 net carbs per day, they have rapid weight loss. You, for most people, if they eat less than 60 net carbs a day, they do lose weight, but somewhere around that 60 to 100 net carbs, they begin to gain weight. And so a target for ideal long-term health would be below 60 to 100 net carbs per day. But it depends on your age, your sex. I'm a man. I'm a man and I'm 37. So I may be able to consume 100 net carbs a day and still lose weight. If I was a woman and I was postmenopausal, that number may be lower, like 50 or 40. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard, but when Weight Watchers used to promote not cutting bread and things like that out of your diet, they would say if you cut all the carbs out of whatever that you would lose the elasticity in your skin. So if we did, say, 20 net carbs a day, will it have an effect on our skin as far as awful? It shouldn't. The, the, the main reason that you, well, I'll tell you this. The truth is in medicine, in medicine, doctors don't know a whole lot of stuff. They think they do. Or So for the elasticity in your skin, you're going to have to find out for yourself. Dr. William Davis in Wheat Belly, he says that skin, and he said that wrinkles in the skin and the problem with skin becoming less elastic over time is advanced glycation end products which is the sugar uh, cross-links the protein, and when cross-links the protein, it damages them. When it damages the proteins, like the collagen is a protein, then it's not as elastic. So his argument would be it's advanced glycation end products, and I would tell you, you have to find the answer for yourself. I mean, if you feel better, you get off your medications, you lose weight, um, then you have to see what happens to your skin. I don't know the answer. And this is just a sample of uh, testing, I mean, how to ca calculate net carbs. This is a sandwich. <coughs> the sandwich has 37 net carbs. You subtract two of the fiber, so you get 35 net carbs in one sandwich. That, if you're trying to stay below 60 a day, this one sandwich is over half your net carbs. That's why you cut the wheat. This is a double XL charbroil with cheese. Total carbohydrates, 62, subtract the fiber, which is five. You're left with 57 net carbs in one hamburger. And this one really illustrates a lot of problems. Uh, number one, it's got the wheat. That's one, one weird reason why it's so high carb. Number two, it's a highly processed food. If you made a hamburger at home from grass-fed beef, how much acid pyrophosphate would you add? <laughs> And how much calcium, stearate, and microcrystalline cellulose? And how much high fructose corn syrup that's up at the top? And how much textured soy protein would you add to your hamburger? None. Packaged foods are packaged for your convenience. They're not packaged for your health. And contrast this to my favorite snack, almonds. Almonds have a total carbohydrate, 6 grams, you subtract out the fiber. 6 minus 4 is 2. There are only 2 net carbs uh, in, in per serving. And I would have 4 servings for a snack, which is about a cup of almonds. So a cup of almonds is only 8 net carbs with a ton of healthy fat and a lot of protein. Um, I encourage you to see the presentation on cutthekillercarbs.com. It's a 2013 presentation, which is a totally different presentation uh, from, from this year. Um, also, you can print out the do's and don'ts document that you guys have got today. You can print it for other people. And you can, on the Facebook page, which is uh, Carbs 101, or you can Google Cut the Killer Carbs Facebook, there are recipes, videos, and tips. Tips and more. I want to take a second just to tell you about this because I haven't told you about your handout the whole time. The magazine came from Natural Health Market and it just has some health things in it. In everybody's handout, there's a free smoothie from Smoothie King, and I'll tell you what kind of low carb smoothie I get there. Uh, there's a do's and don'ts document, two printed documents there. 
There's something from the farmer's market because my wife and I promote the farmer's market and the farmer's market sponsored this event. Oh, the one thing I do want to tell you on your handout. Go ahead and take off on this one. Go ahead and take off the back page because the back page is a comment form. And I want to please get a comment form from every single person so that I can know why you are here and what I can do better next year. <laughs> If you need an additional comment for Christy, Christy, will you pull out? Uh, Christy, will you pull out a bunch of these, bring them in here, and give them to anybody who's written notes on the back of theirs so and they need a new comment form? It's this one with the diagram on the front. And so when Christy comes back in, she has that sweater on. She'll um, she'll give all of you a new comment form if you need one. This CD, these are some meditations, and we'll talk about these later. These meditations help you erase the heart-healthy, whole-grain food pyramid program from your brain and install the Cut the Killer Carbs program. There's also some information about Veritas Medical. Dr. Ben Edwards here in town, he can be your doctor and guide you through a, a guide you through a, a your health journey, not just a sickness journey. Health and chiropractic has some evaluations here. $20 evaluations or, yeah, $20 evaluations. This is from the National Natural Health Market. We'll talk about them a little bit. And there's also, should be, everyone should have a holy cow beef um, thing in there too, and they deliver local grass-fed beef. I just wanted to mention that stuff before we went any further and it was, the whole thing was over and I forgot to talk about any of it. And then this is the food section and my wife covered most of this. Remember, carry gold butter, grass-fed butter, higher in omega-3s, coconut oil, monounsaturated fat. At Smoothie King, you have a free smoothie deal. I usually, if I'm gonna drive through and I want a quick meal, I get the firm and burn smoothie. Firm and burn is this gladiator powder plus penguin powder and peanut butter. So it's chocolate and peanut butter. It tastes delicious. It's uh, high fat, well, oh, not relatively high fat from the peanut butter as far as smoothies go, and uh, high protein. If you make, you can buy these gladiator powders at home. They're 45 grams of protein, only two grams of carbs. When you make them at home, make them with whipping cream and ice. Whipping cream from grass-fed cows. It's like an ice cream. That's my ice cream substitute. We talked about snacks and nuts. Talked about full fat women and dairy. My wife talked about berries. The reason berries are so good is like blackberries have six net carbs per cup. Grapes have 27 net carbs per cup. That's why the berries are so good. A, bo a small box of raisins, small one, has 32 net carbs. So if you're trying to stay below 60, a small box of raisins is half your net carbs for the day. As opposed to a cup of blackberries only has six. So you can have five cups of blackberries, or you can have one small box of raisins. And then there's listed in your handout alternative flowers, acceptable sweeteners, probably the best sweeteners I would recommend for now would be stevia and xylitol. My wife talked about tortillas, you wrap in lettuce. Chocolate, I choose the Ghirardelli 86% dark cocoa. Most chocolate is cocoa flavored sugar. And what you want is mainly cocoa, with just a little bit of sugar. Cookies with almond flour are delicious, and you can start a whole new craze. It can be called the I Eat Cookies All Day Every Day Diet and Lost Weight. <laughs> if you made your cookies out of almond flour, dark chocolate, and an approved sweetener, with lots of healthy fats, you can eat cookies all day, every day, and keep your neck carbs below 30. This deal, I just want to show you this, it's spaghetti squash. If you've never tried spaghetti squash, use this for noodles. That way you have essentially, essentially zero carb noodles. You cook it and then scrape out the strings, which makes your spaghetti. For potatoes, I recommend you use turnips. A potato has 30 net carbs, a turnip has six. So if you're gonna do a stew or a roast, use turnip. For pizza, we use tortillas, ice cream, low carb smoothie like the uh, Gladiator smoothie. Those are, he's a, the Smoothie King's in 19th in Memphis. 
I used to promote another kind of smoothie that I thought tasted delicious, and the reason it tasted delicious was because it was a scam. <laughs> it tasted like malt, and that's because it had a lot of maltose in it, and maltose is a sugar. The reason you don't eat wheat flour is wheat flour has 92 net carbs per cup, along with its addictive, absorbent, and inflammatory gluten. If you make your pancakes out of almond flour, nine net carbs per cup. It's not inflammatory, it has tons of vitamins. Coconut flour and chickpea flour are in the middle and then ground flax seeds you can use as a bread if you're gonna bread and bake or fry chicken or um, chicken or fish. The farmer's market, at the local farmer's market, the downtown farmer's market, you can find locally grown vegetables, free-range eggs, grass-fed beef from Holy Cow, cow Beef, and there's some organic produce. And it's every Saturday, June through October. And my wife and I have been involved with the farmer's market here in town for three years. Uh, because we feel, well, we've been on this kind of health journey for a long time. Is it still year? Yes, ma'am, through October. Oh. Yeah, so there will still be uh, four more markets. I'll see you Saturday at 9 a.m. <laughs> and I use Buddy Holly the Tornado Gallery. Yeah, so come, come out. And if you haven't come out to do it, come out. It's uh, uh, come out at 9 your best selection because people start to sell out. And it, uh, we love it, you know. And then Holy Cow Beef, they're one of the sponsors who help uh, get people out to the meeting. Grass-fed beef is lower in the inflammatory omega-6 fats and higher in omega-3 fats. Grass-fed beef has less contamination with pathogenic bacteria, and that's because cows were made to eat grass. If you feed cows corn, their digestive system grows all these pathogenic bacteria like E. coli 0157H7. This is what causes the outbreaks of Jack in the Box and all those sort of things that you hear about. And it's not because uh, it's not because an employee with contaminated hands touched the meat. It's because the cows themselves were contaminated during the processing because they were growing abnormal bacteria in their gut. And holy cow beef, their stuff is uh, humanely raised without any feedlot con uh, conditions, and they'll deliver to your house. Here in love, if you call them, they deliver to your house. All year round. They will deliver year round. Yes, ma'am. And I'll sell yes. Mm -hmm. So let's do. Uh, we're running 15 minutes behind, and I don't know. I guess we're, we're actually going to do fine because we switched. Yeah, we're going to do fine. You want, let's do. Do you guys have any questions? You want to do five minutes of questions, then a five minute break? Yes, ma'am. Back on the cauliflower versus the rice. What is the carb difference? Cauliflower has like virtually virtually zero carbs. Okay. So cauliflower, you can have like a cup of, I don't know what that, what do they call it when they rice the cauliflower? Oh, they call it rice. Yeah, ricing it. When they rice cauliflower, it may have like two net carbs a cup or, or five net carbs a cup, super low compared to rice. Yeah. You can also make mashed potatoes out of it. Yes, you can make mashed potatoes out of it, have a lot of cream, heavy cream to it, uh, salt and spice. Put cheese on top. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> you can make pizza crust out of cauliflower. The recipes for that. Some people like it. Some people don't. Yes, ma'am. Salt. Do you recommend the sea salt over other salt, or do you think it's different? I don't have any salt recommendation, but I will tell you this: if you have high blood pressure, your doctor tells you to cut the salt. And if you cut the salt in your diet by half, you can lower your blood pressure on average four points. Cut the killer carbs out of your diet, and you can do like I did and lower your blood pressure almost 20 points. So what causes high blood pressure? Is it salt or is it the carbohydrates in the diet? It's the carbs. Yes, sir. Other than that, where does peanut butter fall in all this fall? I think peanut butter is great. I would buy most peanut butters that are available in the store. Uh, most uh, have sugar added to them. So I buy a kind of peanut butter that says no sugar added. And so no sugar added peanut butter has almost exactly the same net carbs as almond. So it's like a nut. Th there are some differences about peanut. They tend to be, you can get into some, some deeper discussions about peanuts tend to be a little bit more contaminated with 
different molds. And peanuts, uh, they're actually a lagoon. They're not really a nut, which means a peanut is a bean. However, I, I think peanut butter for most people is fine. Let's take a five minute break and then we'll start the next hour.